Thank you for viewing this recorded Reliable Automatic Sprinkler Company webinar. Should you have any questions regarding this presentation, please feel free to contact Reliable Technical Services at 800-557-2726 or email us at techserve at reliablesprinkler.com. For upcoming webcasts and an archive of past webcasts, please visit reliablesprinkler.com slash webcasts. Once again, Thank you and enjoy the presentation. Well, welcome everybody uh, to the presentation today. Welcome if it's your first time with Reliable. Welcome back uh, if you've been with us before. Uh, we're going to jump right into it today. Um, you know, the fire protection industry has been very good to me and uh, uh, Reliable in general. So again, the, the fire protection industry has been good to me, Reliable in general, and uh, I, I'd like to start off by sharing a few of my favorite things. A uh, great company vehicle, a uh, great vacation home, country club memberships, designer pets, and a very outstanding long-term healthcare plan. Uh, now, all joking aside, uh, these are not my things, although I did at one point have a dog that looked just like that. Um, but what these things have in common, there is something all of these things have in common. And what they have in common is that they all can be connected to the internet. Uh, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about what has become to be known as the IOT or the internet of things, right? And where did this all start? Uh, well, as near as we can tell, the first connected device comes to us courtesy of the great state of Pennsylvania. Uh, more specifically, the city of Pittsburgh, and even more specifically, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, as the story goes, in the early 1980s, there was a grad student uh, whose office was quite some distance from the nearest Coke machine. And this particular grad student decided that he was getting tired of walking to the Coke machine and having it either be empty or have it be filled with warm Cokes. So he uh, devised a board, a circuit board, that would track the flashing of the lights that occurred when Cokes were purchased out of this machine. And what he did was he hooked it up to, at that time, what was known as the ARPANET, which was a group of about 300 computers worldwide. And from his desk, he was able to determine whether or not he had, could get a cold Coke out of the Coke machine. So uh, this went on for some time, a, a number of other students connected to it. And eventually they also added it to an M&M machine or a candy machine so that the students could uh, you know, not waste their time walking over there. So this just basically goes to prove that the world is run on caffeine and sugar. So uh, since then, obviously massive growth in terms of the uh, number of devices, 127 devices per second, per second being added to the internet. Uh, in 2025, uh, we're expecting to have 75 billion devices connected to the internet, which will be about uh, just short of 10 per person on the planet. And in a couple of years, about 70% of vehicles will also be connected to the internet. So who's using this data? Well, mostly us, business and manufacturing, the uh, healthcare industry making up uh, another portion of it. And, and uh, you know, just trillions of dollars of business being, uh, being crushed, crunched through the internet. Now, I apologize what's happened is I've lost my presenter view here somehow, so I'm, uh, I'm missing some notes. Apologize for that, but we'll press on uh, anyway. Um, now, here's the interesting part. When you pull something off the internet, you're seeing the end result of a massive amount of, of usage of computers. The, uh, the behind the scenes computer uses is a uh, several time factor over what actually presses out uh, to the internet. Um, and uh, again, uh, Trying to just get back to my notes here. Apologize. Give me one second. 
So uh, again, what happens in the in the data center machine um, is several orders of magnitude higher than what goes out on the internet, and the volume uh, of, for instance, at Facebook uh, doubles uh, at an interval of less than one year. Also, what's been happening is technological changes uh, in the computer world, right? So technology affecting technology. Uh, in the year 2000, Seagate came out with a uh, rotational storage device that hit a, uh, a speed of about 15,000 uh, RPM. Uh, getting beyond 15,000 RPM, the, the physics of ro a rotating device become unstable. And so uh, what the industry came up with was what we know today as a non-mechanical or a flash drive. Uh, early flash drives were not very reliable, uh, which is why we stuck with the rotational devices for a while, but they've worked through those challenges. And now we see uh, a massive amount of storage being done on non-mechanical devices. Now, what's the beauty of that? One of the, uh, the biggest expenses, the biggest expense in running a data center is uh, energy and primarily energy for cooling machines, cooling these banks and banks of computers and storage. The non-mechanical flash drives use much less energy, therefore they require less cooling uh, effort and efficiency than do the rotational devices. So we've seen that change taking place over the last uh, couple of decades. And then secondly, we also see other types of changes taking place. So these pictures should be somewhat familiar to the uh, to the sprinkler nerds in the audience. Um, on the left, we have our tree system and on the right, we have our grid system. We all know in the fire protection business, the grid system is going to be our most efficient and uh, effective way of distributing water. But what does this have in common with computers? Uh, early data centers were more like tree systems. They were what were called cluster uh, data centers. And what you had was a uh, an ever more powerful computer controlling a number of other smaller computers downstream of it. So these were built in clusters, uh, not the most efficient way to go, similar to our tree system. We know on a tree system for sprinklers that the piping gets larger as we work our way back to the uh, cross main. We also know that a disruption in uh, any of those pipes uh, affects everything downstream of it. So if we look at our grid system, imagine now our computer system, uh, this would be what's commonly referred to today as a kind of a fabric system, uh, but very similar to what we do with grids, right? We, we like grids because water gets to fire sprinklers from a number of different routes. We use a lot smaller piping. We use more consistent piping. All of these efficiencies that we use for a grid, very similar to what happens with the fabric computer networks. So each of those devices can be smaller. Uh, and we also uh, have the ability that when a we have a disruption in the um, at, at any point on the network, the uh, individual circuits and devices are less important. So we're able to survive, uh, you know, a multiple simultaneous simultaneous component failures uh, by rerouting data and uh, and processing through other methods. So these uh, smaller and simpler devices mean easier troubleshooting, enhanced reliability, and greater resiliency. And resiliency is a is a is a term. Uh, how fast can you come back? from some sort of a disruption in your uh, business process. So what does this all mean? It means that in terms of buildings, we're seeing buildings that are uh, being built larger and faster. Uh, this particular project right here is a Microsoft project that's being built in Dublin, Ireland. Um, worldwide, there are about 430 of what these uh, so-called hyperscale facilities are, and about 40% of them, or uh, just over 170 of these, are in the United States. Faster uh, deployment of these buildings, uh, even though they have more uh, computers within them, uh, because of the efficiency, efficiencies I just spoke of, they're able to deploy these buildings much faster. 
Uh, in terms of the number of servers, uh, I came across some statistics where Microsoft uh, finally released the number of servers that they have on their network. It's uh, slightly over 1 million servers on their network. Uh, Google is bigger and Amazon is a little bit smaller. So that is kind of put in perspective the number of uh, actual computers that we're, that we're talking about here. So in terms of the building itself, um, you know, a new building obviously, uh, you know, is going to be driven by the international building code or whatever those local um, uh, requirements are. But uh, obviously for in terms of resiliency and fire protection and, and everything that comes along with the, uh, the need for a very robust uh, long term building, they're typically going to be built type one or type two non combustible. Uh, could a data center go into a wood building? I don't think there's anything that prohibits that, uh, but obviously there would have to be some consideration given to, you know, is that the best idea? I mean, what what type of resiliency would we have in that world? But uh, again, uh, the building code, just like every other building, drives the type of building and uh, setbacks and, and everything that comes along with it. So is the building special? Is there really anything special about this building? Uh, in terms of the building code, not really. Um, there are specific needs for heating and cooling and energy requirements and exiting and things like that, all driven by the building code. In terms of how it's protected, is it a real special building? Well, in NFPA 13 world, not really. Um, just like every other building, we're told what type of occupancy it is, uh, and we design our sprinkler system around it. Uh, the NFPA 13 does not require any specific type of system in that building. That's all left up to the uh, design professionals. It's a little bit different in the factory mutual world. Uh, factory mutual has its own data sheet 5-32 as you can see on the screen that provides uh, specific requirements that they like to see uh, for their data centers and it goes through doors and windows and ceilings and all kinds of stuff that that uh, in some cases may exceed the requirements of the building code is the building different um, you know it's a building uh, it needs a fire protection system. Uh, how is it different, however, in terms of the end user? Well, it's uh, it's very prone to having issues when we mix water with what's happening in the building. Uh, and in this uh, in this world, in the reliable world, we refer to these as water sensitive environments. Uh, that is really what makes the building different. And uh, you know, does that require a different type of system? Uh, in the NFPA world again, not really. Uh, it, they don't tell us what type of system to put in there. They define the different types of systems that are available. But what about the factory mutual world? What are their recommendations for uh, what type of system to put in these? This you f might find to be a little bit surprising. Let's take a look at the number three spot. The true pre-action system, the single interlock that fills with water upon the detection signal in advance of the fire sprinklers operating. Great, that must mean double interlocks up here somewhere. It's got to be, right? The number two system recommended by Factory Mutual for data centers, the non-interlock. How often do we work with non-interlock pre-action systems? Not very often in 40 years. I've never estimated nor designed one, but here we are in the Factory Mutual world asking for at least us to consider the non-interlock system. The non-interlock system, uh, in case you've forgotten and you, you well may have because we don't use them that often, either operates like a single inter interlock or a dry system. It operates as a single interlock or a dry system uh, and, and that gives us the ability to have a very automatic system or we rely on our detection uh, as well. Great. That must mean, it has to mean, right, that Factory Mutual is going to recommend the double interlock system as the number one choice, correct? You would be wrong, okay? In terms of priority, wet system, non-interlock, single interlock are the recommendations from FM. And I think, F, I think uh, the fire protection industry should give credit to Factory Mutual for this. 
Uh, they understand that the realities of getting water on the uh, on the fire early are very important, and they also understand that uh, the the propensity of false activations when sprinkler systems are installed properly is very, very, very minor. So they would look to the wet system as being the number one choice. Are you going to be able to convince an owner of that? Uh, not very likely, right? Uh, they all think that of course, we have to have the pre-action systems. And why do they want the pre-action systems? Well, there are some reasons for that. Uh, number one, we remove water from over top of the equipment, right? With the pre-action systems, uh, single interlock or double interlock, uh, there is no water in the pipe short of maybe some uh, residual moisture from uh, testing or an earlier trip. Uh, or in the case of uh, the way some systems are designed, there might be some residual water in a drop, for instance. Uh, but the, uh, the, the ability to take large amounts of water out of the room and control it back in a riser area is uh, one of the reasons we like pre-action. What is the second reason? The second reason with pre-action systems, be they single or double interlock, is the ability to pick up the fire very early in the uh, in the fire stage and give us an alarm event to tell us something is happening. OK, uh, what what do we do at that point? We now know that something is happening. Uh, if we can and we can do it safely, we are going to pre act to avoid the accidental release of water into the environment. That is where the term comes from, the word pre-action, um, not what the system is doing, but what is the what are the people doing in the building? They're going to pre-act instead of react. And all of this is to prevent the uh-oh scenario. Uh, anybody that's had a child would recognize this face and exactly what it means. So we've got to be very careful that we're not uh, uh, putting the uh, owner's uh, business at risk by uh, discharging water accidentally into the building. All of this is done with the deluge valve. Interestingly enough, in NFPA 25, they give us criteria for how to treat a pre-action valve. Uh, reliable nor any other manufacturer, to my knowledge, makes a pre-action valve, and I would put quotes around that. Deluge valves are used to create, create and build pre-action systems. Two basic types of deluge valve, the latching clapper style deluge valve on the left and a diaphragm style deluge valve on the right. Both of these valves, both of these systems rely on hydraulic pressure to hold the valve closed and they rely on the release of hydraulic pressure to open the valve. Uh, the benefit of the diaphragm deluge valve over the latching clapper valve, if there is one, would be the ability to stop the water flow from a remote location. We don't typically see that requirement called for in data centers. That would be something more in the lines of a tunnel application or perhaps an aircraft hangar, uh, but it certainly could be uh, implemented in terms of a data center uh, if the local authorities, uh, improving agencies were, uh, were on board with that. The release of hydraulic pressure to release the valve is controlled by a detection system. Is that detection system special? Well, again, in the NFPA 72 world, uh, it's going to give us the guidance for how to do what we select. Uh, in the FM world, they're going to give us some guidance on exactly what we select and what do we use to release that system. Information about detect detectors and spacing and things like that with slope ceilings, all of that good criteria for FM can be found in uh, FM 5-48. And then be aware also that there is some generic information in data sheet 5-40 for fire alarm systems. So those two kind of have to work hand in hand. But what is it that we are looking for? Well, primarily what we see or what we're going to see is a cross zone system that's looking for two things. And number one, of course, smoke. Uh, smoke is gonna get uh, to the roof uh, in advance of the heat. Uh, it's also gonna give us that very early warning that we're looking for. In fact, uh, Factory Mutual uses the uh, acronym VEWFD, very early warning fire detection. Uh, that's just their terminology for it. And there are different ways of doing that. 
Uh, the very sensitive ones are the uh, VESDA systems or the FAST systems as they're called. Uh, these are 24-7, uh, uh, 365 dynamic uh, sniffer systems that are extremely sensitive and give us that, that very early notification uh, of a fire event. Once we've picked up the smoke and we either have or haven't responded, the next thing that's coming uh, in the way of the uh, getting to the ceiling obviously is going to be the heat. Uh, so next we're going to pick up the heat. Important to remember that all of this happens in advance of the operation of the fire sprinklers when things are working properly. Uh, even our heat detectors are going to sense heat at a lower temperature than our fire sprinklers. Uh, we want the fire sprinkler opening to be the end result of everything else having happened and uh, not having been responded to. So uh, in terms of heat detection, we have addressable heat detectors, uh, spot detectors that are simple analog switches, uh, and we have things like protecto wire or linear cable uh, and in modern day fiber optic linear cable that can actually tell us exactly where in the building uh, our fire scenario is at. Now the reality is even though we talk about pre-action systems, Pre-action systems are nothing more than a glorified wet pipe or a dry pipe system. It's simply what are we doing with the detection? How are we utilizing it? In the single interlock world, our detection event converts our supervised piping into a wet system, right? We have a uh, detection event. We immediately open the solenoid on the, uh, on the pre, uh, sorry, I almost said it, on the deluge valve and we flood the pipe full of water in advance of the fire, sprinkler, fire sprinklers opening. We essentially kind of just converted that into a wet pipe system and there are some benefits of that because the next event of the fire sprinkler opening, we immediately have water on the fire. As opposed to our double interlock system wherein our detection essentially converts our supervised piping into a dry pipe system. Detection goes off, we do not release the deluge valve. However, the next event that would occur is the opening of a fire sprinkler, and that in, uh, by definition is a dry pipe system. Uh, so again, it's what, what are we doing with the, de de the detection? How are we using it to uh, make our double uh, interlock or our single interlock system work? So Here's, uh, here's one of my all-time favorite TV shows, uh, Mr. Dwight Schrute, two is better than one, wrong, no, two is just more than one. Well, he's not technically right in this case. Um, uh, in the case of the double interlock, we are gonna see some benefits. By the way, has anybody ever had a coworker like this uh, other than me? And you guys know who you are. So when we talk about a double interlock, we have to define what the double is. Uh, we have a couple different types of this that are gonna be primarily used uh, in, the, uh, in the data center world. The electric electric in the reliable world, we would call this our type D for data. Uh, two signals must coexist to release the valve. The first one comes in from our detection system. The second one is a signal that captures the loss of the pressure on the system due to a fire sprinkler opening. And those two signals, when they coexist, uh, are sent to the, to the release panel and the release panel alone determines when to open our deluge valve. There are some advantages and disadvantages to this type of system. Number one, from an advantage standpoint, it is the least complex. Number two, it operates on very low pneumatic pressure. We're not offsetting water pressure uh, using any type of differential or any type of an actuator. We are simply using a pressure switch. We can adjust the, uh, the sensitivity of that pressure switch to affect how fast the system operates, which means that an accelerator does us absolutely no good on this type of system. All the fitters in the world would love to see the accelerators go away. Uh, what is the disadvantage of this? They can be sensitive to electrical problems. Um, uh, lightning strikes have been known to um, set solenoids into action when they shouldn't. 
the potential of wires getting crossed during service work or maintenance work uh, in a detection system and release system uh, could potentially release a solenoid accidentally. So there are some uh, concerns there potentially with that. The option to that is the electric pneumatic system. Again, in the reliable world, this would be the type F. We primarily see this used for freezer applications, but it is uh, perfectly acceptable and might be a good idea in the data center world as well. Uh, for the electric pneumatic, two separate events must occur, not simply electric signals, but two events. And these events, again, must coexist. Number one, our detection is going to operate our solenoid valve. Now, you would think that that would trip the system, but what we're going to do in this case is we're going to back that solenoid up with a pneumatic actuator that's going to hold close with the pressure that's on the system. Only until the pneumatic actuator opens does our system trip. That becomes our double event. Uh, and then what is responsible for re releasing the system? The combination of the release panel and the physical loss of pressure across a mechanical device. So we get a little extra uh, advantage there from that. Again, the advantage that actuator provides an additional safety factor. If we accidentally open the solenoid valve, as long as we have air pressure or nitrogen pressure on our system, our system is going to stay intact. So we like that additional insurance. What are some of the disadvantages potentially? Uh, I would say a slightly increased complexity uh, in the system. Not really that much different. Again, all we're doing is adding a pneumatic actuator downstream of the, uh, of the solenoid valve. It is going to run on higher pneumatic pressure because we are offsetting water pressure uh, on the release line across a uh, pneumatic actuator. If the water pressure goes up, the pressure in the system is going to go up. And what does that mean to us? That means that potentially on larger systems, we may need to dispel that air out of the system quicker and we would install an accelerator or a quick opening vice device to help us with that, uh, with that uh, process. In both cases, the strong recommendation, although not a requirement unless it's in your specifications or a requirement of your local jurisdiction or factory mutual, would be to install what's known as a release circuit disable switch. That's a uh, that's a term that Potter uses. I, I'm not familiar with the terms of the other uh, suppliers, um, but the RCDS switch allows you with a key switch to disable the power from getting to the solenoid valve. At the same time, it puts the panel into a supervisory condition so that the switch can't be left active. What this does when you're doing your uh, NFPA 25 maintenance is it prevents that solenoid from uh, triggering uh, if something is done out of order or unexpectedly. So very strong recommendation to install the RCDS. Um, reliable manufacturers are uh, pre-pack systems in cabinets um, uh, are pre-packs and uh, this is a now a, um, a standard equipment in all of our pre-packs is the RCDS. The second uh, recommendation would be to install an upper control valve. Uh, for refrigerator systems, I know that's not what we're talking about, but just additional training for refrigerator systems. These are now required by NFPA 13. They used to be in the annex, they're now in the body. This would be a very good um, uh, option to install or sell to your, to your customer for any type of special system like this is that upper control valve that will allow the NFPA 25 maintenance crew to close that valve down and prevent water from getting past it. Uh, when done properly, it allows full functionability and testing uh, of the system uh, without the uh, potential of putting water out into our protected environment. Is there anything else to be thinking of in terms of uh, the pre-action systems? Yes, particularly with the double interlock systems. Remember that you will be penalized if that's the term you want to use uh, for using double interlock systems because they are considered a type of dry pipe system. You will have 30% remote area increase. You will have C factor of 100. You will have a 60 second uh, water delivery time if that's your criteria. So all of those things are going to apply to the double interlock world. And with any pre-action system that spends most of its life full of air, 
Uh, in the presence of steel and moisture, we are going to have corrosion uh, issues uh, that are uh, potentially going to arise. And uh, Jake uh, in a little bit here is going to talk about some of the ways to help prevent that. What about the fire sprinklers? Is there anything special about those? Not really. Uh, again, it's a building. Uh, it's going to it's going to it's going to get sprinkler just like every other building. Uh, the sprinklers and the pipe uh, and NFPA 13 doesn't know if it's a data center or not. We are going to take those special considerations into effect uh, with regard uh, uh, with regard to the system. But as far as the sprinklers, anything that works um, on a dry system or pre action system is is permitted upright listed dry. Uh, and then pendant sprinklers on return bends uh, when we have a warm area above and below. Interestingly enough, um, the item number five on this list, pendant and sidewall sprinklers without return bends where the water is potable and we're using CPVC or copper. Uh, I've been in the business for 40 years and just this week putting this presentation together did I realize that that was in there. So things are changing all the time. Keep your eyes open and uh, pay attention to the details. What else is important with regard to the sprinklers? The temperature, right? We uh, we mentioned earlier that the, the number one uh, expense of operating a data center is cooling these machines. How is this done? Um, a lot of different ways, but in some form or fashion, the uh, the hot gases or the hot air coming off these machines is contained. If you look at the picture here in the center, imagine this were a double row rack, uh, like a conventional double row rack, and you were pulling cool air in from the load aisle into the longitudinal flue, containing it and sending it up to be conditioned. That's kind of what we have going on here. So uh, two rows of, of computers are contained with some sort of a, either solid or, or flexible uh, uh, containment system. The cool air is pulled across the computers into the hot containment area and then pulled out of there and conditioned and either brought back through a ceiling uh, diffuser system or through a raised floor system. So what's important there is that the sprinklers protecting the hot areas, the hot containment or the hot aisles as they're sometimes referred to, uh, have to be considered in terms of the uh, temperature rating. Uh, we see sprinklers in the 200, 212 degree range, but very important to, to double check with the operators of that facility to see what temperatures are expected in those, uh, in those different aisles. As far as pipe goes, uh, we're not going to really uh, expect to see copper or CPVC. Let's face it, it's going to typically be steel pipe. So your choice is black steel pipe again or galvanized. Uh, Jake will probably touch on this as well. What some of the uh, things we've learned in the past uh, 10 years or so in terms of, of the benefits or uh, the benefits that we thought we were getting out of galvanized pipe. But again, a decision to be made there in terms of black steel pipe or galvanized pipe. What about the wall thickness? That would be another decision to keep in mind. If it's uh, if it's not specified, the uh, NFPA would tell us that um, you know we can essentially use any pipe that's acceptable. If we have a specification, we're going to want to pay very special uh, attention to that to to make sure that we're providing the pipe um, thickness, the wall thickness that we're after. But a best practice scenario would possibly be to use cut groove schedule 40 uh, for our groove piping and that cut groove schedule 40 uh, is going to prevent the small dams being uh, created when we roll groove piping and those small dams are where moisture is going to is going to capture and uh, affect our lifespan of our pipe uh, of our piping so we might see a lot more use of uh, of schedule 40 which will make our pipe suppliers uh, pretty happy as well from an installation standpoint, um, all pre-action system piping has to be sloped. Um, so if you have the opportunity and you may have the requirement, again, pay attention to the details and the specifications, exaggerate the slope on the piping. That's one of the uh, key things that we've learned over the years and how to prevent corrosion is uh, even if we're required to have a quarter inch per foot, maybe we want to exaggerate that slope and and uh, express that water out of that piping much quicker so uh, that would be a best practice to over exaggerate the slope of that pipe 
Anything else in terms of the piping? Yeah, you want to pay special attention again to the uh, to the critical nature of these facilities and whether or not you might be adding seismic protection or uh, or branch line restraint potentially in areas that might otherwise not require it. Uh, I would certainly keep an eye out for that in the specifications. If you uh, want to start treating this like every other warehouse job that you do, uh, you might find yourself in a little bit of a pickle there if you've missed a lot of uh, seismic bracing. In terms of the pneumatic source, again, NFPA not going to give us any guidance there other than fill it full of the appropriate amount of uh, pressure, either from air or nitrogen. And we're going to let Jake talk about that here in just a few minutes. Um, we would want to think very carefully about pumping hot, moist air into the system in terms of the lifespan of the piping and the potential effects, uh, ill effects of corrosion in the system. Uh, but it certainly could be done. Uh, Factory Mutual is going to give us some uh, strong recommendations or requirements on what they're after. It might be something in terms of a regenerative air dryer or perhaps even uh, nitrogen requirements on the system. So all of these things uh, in terms of uh, escalating uh, best practices is, is kind of what we're talking about here. Um, if you're familiar with Reliable, uh, you've probably heard us say it a million times. Um, please, please, please always use a tank mounted system with a mechanical regulating device. Um, we, uh, we were going to see time and time again where tankless compressors, particularly in pre-action and these, uh, these very complex systems, uh, just simply add to the, to the problems that you're going to face. So best practice again, uh, always use mechanical regulating devices. And of course, if you're trying to feed more than one system off of a pneumatic source, it must be on a tank and it must have, each system must have its own individual air maintenance device. And then finally, what I would tell you at the end of the presentation here is finish the job, okay? And by finish the job, what I mean there is that installation and maintenance it should be about continuous operation. That's what these uh, facility operators are looking for is non-interruption, uh, continuous operation. So what's going to be the, the key to that is ongoing maintenance. Uh, put a robust maintenance program in place. We want to make sure that this system discharges water when it should. And we also want to make sure that it doesn't discharge water when it shouldn't. So you have installed the system. If you're the sprinkler contractor, you know this system the best. Uh, why would you let anyone go else go out there and take care of this? So at the end of these projects, hopefully everyone's making a, a proposal to the owner for the ongoing NFPA 25 uh, maintenance. Uh, you know, that's good recurring revenue uh, at the end of this project. Uh, at the end of these projects and, and let's be fair if uh, if someone else even if someone else takes over the NFPA 25 maintenance on this project uh, and six months from now the system trips you're going to get a phone call as well as they are so uh, I would uh, strongly recommend that you uh, the installing contractor if that's who uh, my audience is are taking care of these systems uh, after they've been installed and turned over to the owner. So with that being said, um, as always, uh, questions for uh, Reliable, 1-800-55-RASCO or TechServe at uh, ReliableSprinkler.com. We'll get uh, one of our tech service managers and we'll get your questions answered for this presentation or anything else that comes up in the future. So at this time, uh, right at 40 minutes as promised, I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay, who's going to do a quick introduction of Mr. Jake from State Farm. I mean South Tech. <laughs> Great. Uh, Jake Lehman is the Fire Protection Product Manager at South Tech Systems. Jake has more than five years as the Fire Protection Team Lead responsible in the sales and support of the N2 Blast and Deox corrosion inhibiting solutions for use in dry, pre-action, and wet fire protection systems. Welcome, Jake. Oh, thank you. I'll be, let me get my screen going here. All right, so as, as Carrie talked about, the dry pre-action systems um, have, you know, corrosion issues that come up inside of them, and it's something that you don't see, especially in, in data centers. A lot of times, once you're, once these buildings are finished out, you, you may have to do some looking to actually see the, the pre-action system up above all the, all of the other stuff that's running through the ceilings between the cabling and the, the cooling and other, other aspects of the the data center itself but inside that pipe what you don't know 
can be affecting you and can could be costing you know a potential problem coming up sooner that may cause downtime. So internally on the pipe, this is the th type of things that can build up. All it takes is a, a, a couple factors present for the corrosion to take place on the inside of these pipes. There's a couple different studies that have been done. Uh, FM has done testing where they found that 59% of fire losses are caused by corrosion related obstructions to sprinkler flow. VDS is basically another variation of FM in Germany and what they have found that in 12 and a half years, 73% of all dry and pre-action systems inspected have significant corrosion issues taking place inside there. So these issues can pop up, they can cause you know, property damage, ongoing pipe repair replacement, decreased C factor, sprinkler head blockage, and even render that fire protection system inoperable in the event of a fire. But more importantly, inside the data centers, it's it's about downtime, right? Downtime can come from all different opt obstacles from, you know, you could have pipe leaking, you can have servers going down, you can have uh, software upgrades and stuff like that. And downtime is very costly inside these systems. Um, some different studies show that it could be as much as $9,000 to $10,000 a minute with the average downtime being anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half. That could be upwards of, you know, three quarters to a million dollars of of lost revenue that takes place just due to simple downtime. So one factor that can be removed is the corrosion that takes place on the inside of these pipes. So the most common type that takes place is going to be electrochemical, where you have unprotected metal, as Carrie mentioned, that you're not typically gonna see CV CPVC piping in this type of setup. You're gonna see either galvanized or black piping. So you've got metal pipe, you've got oxygen, if source that's inside there. So the air we breathe has 20.9% oxygen in it. If you're using an air compressor to keep that supervisory pressure on the systems to help hold the clapper back, you're going to be having an inex inexhaustible source of oxygen being pumped into there. And then electrolyte or moisture, water in these systems. That can come either from leftover residual from hydro testing, or even if you've got that warm air coming in from an air compressor, um, cooling down, as that cools down, condensate builds up inside that pipe. So all three factors can be present with the use of compressed air, metal, and water left over in the system. So we have to remove one of these factors in order to successfully inhibit corrosion. We can't get rid of the metal piping and the water is virtually impossible sometimes to drain out of these systems, depending on how they're designed, the type of pipe that's being used, if it's rolled grooved versus cut grooved, if the systems pitch properly, um, also time, time is against us. So the building settles at all, you lose some of that pitch, you may end up with areas of trapped water in there. But oxygen is the one thing that we can take out of this system and replace it with nitrogen. By doing that, we can successfully inhibit corrosion taking place on the inside of these pipes. And, and how do we know that it works? Well, back in 2009, a long-term exposure test was set up with Schedule 10, two and a half inch black steel pipe and schedule 10, two and a half inch galvanized pipe. Um, to find out really where the best corrosion inhibiting properties were taking place, we set up three different scenarios. So in one set, we have plain old compressed air. Another set, we have 95% nitrogen. And a third set, we put 98% nitrogen. And the reason for that was to find out really what, what was our ideal nitrogen content that needed to be in there to provide us the most life out of these systems and also back then there was really no industry standard for what was ideal for nitrogen purity being used in dry and pre-action systems so these three systems were set up um, we partnered with a third-party metallurgist that's this gentleman that you see down here in the the bottom right dr ockert vandersheif he's got 30 plus years of inspecting um, sprinkler piping throughout the, the country in different types of systems to see what kind of issues that they're having so the way this was set up, we also wanted to simulate worst case scenario. What happens if you do have trapped water in these systems and you can't get it out? Is the nitrogen going to provide any more benefit or should we look at just continuing with compressed air? So in each set, we've, like I said, compressed air, 95% nitrogen, 98% nitrogen, all of them half full of water to simulate worst, worst case scenario. Once a year, an 18 inch section of each pipe was removed. We sent it out to be dissected and determine the corrosion that's taking place inside these systems. So the black steel piping, what we're looking at is a uniform wall thinning that takes place inside that pipe. Whereas the galvanized pipe, we're looking at the average pit depth that was taking place. So let's get into the actual results 
um, from this testing and see what we came up with. So as I mentioned, the electrochemical corrosion, oxygen, metal, and water taking place on black steel pipe, what you get is a uniform corrosion, uniform wall loss that takes place in there, but you do get large amounts of corrosion deposits that build up. When these deposits build up, you can end up with pockets of accelerated corrosion, and you can see your pinhole leaks in much shorter time, as, as, as little as 18 months, 24 months, pinhole leaks can start to appear in these systems. So here's the, the, the last set of samples that were pulled on this particular test. Schedule 10 black steel pipe, left-hand side as it was received, right-hand side after it has been cleaned so that we can pull the, the pipe wall thickness on it. And under Schedule 10 black steel, you can see with compressed air on average, about 15 to 20 years was the, the average pipe service life. 95% nitrogen really didn't provide a whole lot more benefit, but once we hit the 98% threshold, now we were able to take the life of that pipe and triple it outside of just standard compressed air inside there. So if you look at this pipe down here on the bottom left, you can see that was before they cleaned it. All that's taken place in there is just a little bit of surface rust. Um, after it's cleaned up, that pipe looks brand new. So that is not only going to ensure that the inside of that pipe is corrosion free, but you're not having these obstructions building up and the, that fire sprinkler system is going to function as it was designed, the same C factors, the same water delivery times, um, ensuring that this life safety system works when it's called upon. Here's what's happening with the galvanized pipe. What we were seeing is that instead of a more uniform corrosion that we're seeing on the black steel pipe, we're seeing more of an average pit depth taking place inside here. So what's happening is the galvanized coating that's inside there, that zinc coating, is a sacrificial metal and it gives up its electrons first so that sacrifices itself but once that happens you end up with areas of localized corrosion corrosion so it's almost like somebody taking a drill or a bore to the inside of that pipe and working their way through it at a much faster rate from there so here's the test results on the schedule 10 galvanized piping as you can see versus the 20 years on black steel pipe it was only about 10 on average with the, the galvanized pipe. Same thing with the 95%, not a whole lot more benefit, but once we put the 98% in there, not only is it protecting that underlying steel pipe, it's protecting that sacrificial zinc metal that's inside there. So now you're taking it and extending the life out to over 150 plus years. And the only thing that's been done differently in these pipes is we replace the oxygen with nitrogen. Once we hit 98%, that's really gonna be the, the point where the returns become extremely more beneficial on that. So, you know, for years it was said galvanized pipe was the way that we wanted to go with these systems. Um, FM did testing, other people did testing, and what you can see is, like I said, much shorter life with these systems. If you roll groove galvanized pipe, typically the first place that the zinc coating pops off is at the roll groove. That also tends to be the location where water can collect if there's moisture inside these systems. So if you've got an air compressor with that, you've brought all three parts of the corrosion triangle together in one area, significantly reducing the life of that system. So depending on what the specification calls for, or the, the project calls for, you know, you can go from black 20 to 60 years on black steel pipe from 10 to 150 plus on galvanized pipe. A lot of cost savings can be realized just by utilizing black steel pipe in lieu of galvanized piping. And a lot of times cost between that pipe can be exponential depending on the size of the facility. If it's a large facility, 200, 300,000 square feet, you can take that cost savings, put that towards the use of, of nitrogen versus just plain old compressed air in the system and extend the life of that system out to 60 years versus what could potentially be 10 if you're using thin wall pipe. Obviously, if we go to schedule 40 pipe like Carrie spoke about, you're going to see more life out of these systems because you have a thicker wall to go through. But on the downside of that with schedule 40 black steel pipe with compressed air, you also have more wall there to degrade and create corrosion deposits inside that piping. All right, so let's talk about how we get the nitrogen from the air. So the air we breathe has about 78% nitrogen in it. And there's really three different ways to extract the nitrogen from the air. So at South Tech, we utilize um, just one or two of the three ways. One, one way is cryogenically, where you can take the air, the air temperature down to negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit, and you're able to actually extract the nitrogen out of the air in the form of a liquid.
this isn't really cost effective for these applications. Um, so this is not something that we utilize for the fire protection industry. Um, some of the, the other way that we can utilize is membrane technology. This is more like a filter that you can utilize. You push compressed air through it and you're able to get nitrogen purity out of the other side of it. But the way that we really focus on for the fire protection industry um, for the most cost effective route is going to be what we call PSA or pressure swing absorption technology. Um, with this technology, it takes about two parts air in to get one part nitrogen out. And the way that it works is these generators are set up with two sieve beds filled with a carbon molecular sieve material or CMS. This CMS is specifically designed that when compressed air is pushed into it, the oxygen molecules are forced into that sieve material through absorption process. That allows for the nitrogen molecules to flow out to the storage tank and then from there out to the sprinkler system. Once that sieve material has been fully saturated, we, re we relieve pressure off of that bed and swing pressure over to the other bed. So the process is essentially swinging pressure back and forth between the two sieve beds to extract the nitrogen from the air. By doing this technology, like I said, two parts air into one part nitrogen out versus three to one on membrane, um, the, pro the separation process can start as low as 40 pounds of pressure um, and then it averages around 70 pounds to extract that nitrogen from the air versus a membrane typically takes about 20, 125 pounds of pressure in order for that separation process to take place. Um, performance is going to be a lot better, you know, less workload on the feed air compressor. Also longevity. The sieve material is going to get about 20 to 25 year lifespan before it needs to be renourished versus about 8 to 13 years on a membrane. So that means it's going to hold purity longer, output more nitrogen, and the cost of replacement down the road is also less costly. Sieve material is going to run you about a 10% initial cost of the equipment versus a membrane is going to run you about 20 to 30% initial cost. So the cost of ownership of a PSA generator is going to be a lot less over, over the lifespan of it versus that of a membrane generator and the initial upfront cost is identical. So let's talk about the nitrogen generators and what's involved with them and the size of the equipment and how they can fit into these facilities. So we carry a multitude of different models from wall mounts for smaller applications where you may have just a, a small server room um, or you know multiple small server rooms that you're trying to maintain off of one piece of equipment all the way up to the larger equipment these skid mount units that can handle full facilities that are four or five six hundred thousand square feet off of one piece of equipment to maintain your nitrogen pressure in all these pre-action systems so on the smaller module systems you have a small wall mount generator you have a buffer tank and then you'll have an air compressor so the way that it works nfpa code still dictates that you have to fill the system up to pressure within 30 minutes. So in order to do that, compressed air is used to bring your system up to pressure. Um, after the system's up to pressure per your 30 minute fill requirements, then the nitrogen generator is brought online to maintain supervisory pressure. So I know the question that typically comes is, well, wait a minute, you just filled it with air and you just told us how bad that was. That's correct, but the, give me a couple slides and I'll show you how we evacuate that air out of that system and replace it with the nitrogen. So systems filled with air, nitrogen generators brought online, and that's going to maintain supervisory pressure. These wall mount units can handle up to 900 gallons of total sprinkler pipe capacity. Um, these are good options if you have, you know, a single system or multiple systems that you're trying to supervise off of one piece of equipment. So the 500 can handle up to 500 gallons of sprinkler pipe capacity, 900 up to that. The middle size units, these allow you to get multiple pre-action systems tied into it or maybe there's a bank of risers on each side of the building as long as you can run a supply line between them you can use one piece of equipment to supervise all the pre-action systems or the dry systems in that facility um, with one supervisory device so the middle size units they're they're skid mounted they're about two foot wide 18 inches deep 50 inches tall not very large you have an air compressor that supplies not only your air to meet your 30 minute fill requirements but supplies that feed air that you need to make nitrogen so on the smaller generators there's an internal compressor on the larger ones we have an external compressor once we get into the larger systems your 10,000 16,500 22,500 this is how many gallons they can handle like i mentioned these are larger much larger facilities if you've got a large three four five hundred thousand square foot facility as long as the supply piping can be run around to your different risers one piece of equipment can be used for 
a multitude of dryer pre-action systems. Um, as with the Internet of Things, everything is becoming smarter. You have more technology being introduced into these. Um, and the same thing has gone for the, the nitrogen generators for fire protection. If you look at the evolution of them, they have become smaller in footprint, um, more compact, easier to install, and they have more technology involved. So one of the things that is built into these generators now is uh, smart track technology. The smaller units have PLCs on them. The larger units have PLCs on them. They can do all kinds of different things from tracking how much nitrogen has been introduced to that system based on the last time it ran that day, that month. You can go back and look at a 12 month history. You can hit an operations button and see exactly what the equipment's doing in real time. Um, it tracks runtime. It has maintenance reminders in it um, to tell you when to change your filters and how, how frequently that needs to be done. Um, this also gives you building automation. You can hook this these systems up to your building automation system and pull the data directly off the equipment. Uh, anything that has a PLC on it can be hooked to an Ethernet connection and pulled up remotely. So these can be monitored if you have multiple facilities around the country. For a central location can pull up and read the equipment and see what's going on all over the country on these types of types of equipment. So. Um, you know, more smart technologies being introduced into these things to make sure that the equipment stays up and that you don't have downtime on it and that your your annual maintenance is being maintained and performed as you schedule it. Um, another advantage to the nitrogen generators is we are able to work closely hand in hand with Reliable with their prepack that Carrie mentioned earlier and integrate the nitrogen right into that cabinet. So the riser rooms are not getting any larger. So a lot of times it may end up, especially in a data center where this is out on the data hall and you don't want to necessarily have that riser equipment sitting right there. So you have these nice compact cabinets that are able to house your, your dry, your pre-action systems inside of them along with your nitrogen generator and everything is, is very plug and play friendly. So with this particular setup um, that we partnered with Reliable on, we have the 900 gallon setup for the generator. So that can handle up to 900 gallons. These are FM approved. We're using pressure swing absorption technology. They include the purge device, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide. And it look, you know, they have about four different models here um, available from two, two and a half, three to four inch with the type D, DDX and DDX LP dry, you know, valves available. Um, Carrie, you got anything else that you want to add as far as the the prepack systems? No, I think no, we're I think pretty we're good pretty there, good Jake. There. I appreciate no, you covering that. Covered. Not a problem. So yeah, very easy water connection, um, water electrical. You can come in both sides on it, so it makes for easy installation, especially in a lot of these data centers that I've seen where the risers are located out in an area where people are walking by or just not. You don't have the you don't have the space in the riser room for it. This is a, a great alternative. They can be specified in. Um, I know they have seismic bracing as well, so that that really covers the nitrogen generators. Um, as I mentioned earlier, let me step back. Actually, these these units as well also have an air compressor in them for the 30 minute fill and then one for the nitrogen generator in there. So same same setup as the larger standalone units. You're going to do your quick fill with compressed air. Then the nitrogen generator is brought online and that's going to maintain supervisory pressure. So after the initial fill, and I promise it's been coming, we have our purge devices. So these purge devices are pneumatic and they're custom tunable based on how many gallons you have on that system. So what that does is that ensures that in about two weeks time period, you're able to change that system over from plain old compressed air to 98% plus nitrogen going throughout them. Um, another benefit to these is they can be located remotely on the system typically in an area where water is not going to collect, but they're accessible by looking at them that you can ensure that you're getting getting flow out to the system and ensuring that you don't have a potential water trap somewhere in there. If the ball is floating on this particular unit, you know you're getting flow out there. You're getting that system continuously blanketed with 98% nitrogen purity. Um, it also provides a connection point for checking the purity. So you have a handheld sensor, short piece of tube, and a reverse thread nut to check the purity on it. You turn it on, it'll calibrate to atmosphere, so it starts reading 79.1. You connect it up to the purge device, and within a minute or two, you're going to be able to tell if you've got that 98% that you need to protect the system throughout. 
Um, recommended that this is done on, you know, after the first couple of weeks that the system's been installed. And then when you're doing quarterlies, go around and check your purity and make sure that you're maintaining that 98%. Because from the testing, you can see there's a large difference between 95% purity and 98% purity. So it's very important that this is checked. It's not a very time consuming process, but it is important to make sure that we're keeping that purity where it needs to be. Now, sometimes it's just not possible to get around to these FERS devices to check them, or um, you're looking for more of a hands-off approach to monitoring purity. So the purity manifolds are a great op uh, an option for this. They're not required unless you know written into the specification or um, end user required, but these manifolds will monitor purity in up to 20 different zones and check it on a daily basis and let you know directly on the screen what the reading is. So you can look at it and see that you got purity, see that you got flow, and then you can hit the purity button and see exactly what the purity is in each individual zone. Um, these come in 1, 6, 10, and 20 zones. These can be paired with the generators. These can be paired with the pre-packs. Um, great alternative for checking it. They hook to the auto purge device with quarter inch plenum rated tubing, which means that you don't have to bring in additional electrical connections for each one of the purge devices. Um, and that that manifold can be centrally mounted somewhere in the facility to provide the most convenient location for not only bringing that tubing to it, but also for um, monitoring it. You can put it in a facility manager's office or a control office. It does not have to be out by the risers. Um, the other advantage to this, because it has a PLC, it can be remotely monitored as well. So you can hook to an ethernet connection, pull it up remotely. Uh, Modbus connections are available as well so that you can pull off the purity of the pressure uh, or not pressure, but the flow and maintenance reminders out of this as well. So this just shows the, the tubing that connects to it, run it back to the location of the purity manifold. And like I said, this is going to go through. You can set it up. You can have it check every day. You can you can change it if you wanted to check every third day. It'll give you notifications if the purity level drops for what re for whatever reason. If the flow is not being achieved at the at the manifold, it'll let you know that as well and all through remote monitoring capabilities as well as local alarms that are built right into the to the unit. So if you're working on these projects and you want to get an idea of what what's going to best suit your situation, there's three simple questions that we need to know. How many how many risers are within the facility? What's the capacity or square footage of it? And is it feasible to co connect them together? Um, another good indicator is what where are you planning on locating these things? That way we can determine if a pre-pack is the best solution or if we need to go with something more standalone on that. So multiple different options on there. You can connect with Reliable, you can connect with South Tech, and either one of us will be able to point you in the right direction and help you with whatever situation you're looking at. As far as maintenance goes, um, it is a piece of equipment. It does require maintenance, but on the, the generators, it's a pretty pretty straightforward, pretty simple maintenance that needs to be taking place. On a quarterly basis, um, if it's got a standalone oil-based compressor, we just recommend that you check the belts, you wipe down the surface, and you inspect the oil level. On the generators, um, clean the strainers out on the auto purge. If it's an existing system, we'd recommend that quarterly. If it's new, you can put that into your annuals. Check your purity. Make sure you're keeping that 98% throughout there. Check your runtime. This equipment's going to run little more than an air compressor because it does take more feed air to extract the nitrogen, but about three to five hours a day is normal runtime. So in a quarterly that can all be done really quickly just by walking by the equipment and and checking it out as well as checking with the purity with either the handheld or the, the manifold. Um, on an annual basis, air compressor change oil and filter like you normally would and then all the generators are set up with three filters to be changed out once a year. Rinse out the inside of the filter bowls the filter kits come as a kit, so you get the three filters, the, the O-rings that come with them. They're designed to be set up so that they only fit in one spot, so we try to make them very user-friendly if that comes down to it. So it really should be about 20, 30-minute job to re replace filters on any of these units. Check your purity as well on your annuals, and then check your runtime. About 1,000 hours a year is going to be normal runtime. Now, that can be a little less or a little more depending on your system and, and how leak tight it is from there. But that's, that really talks about the equipment for nitrogen and how to inhibit corrosion inside these pipes. Um, a lot of times the pre-action system is just one, one source of suppression inside there. 
um, but it's kind of can be forgot about and, and thought secondly of and you don't know what's happening on the inside of that pipe. So five, every five years you should be doing internal inspections on that to make sure that that pipe is not getting corrosion buildup in there. But if you're ensuring that you got 98% and you're testing it and making sure that it's being maintained at 98%, the science proves that it's going to inhibit corrosion. It's going to extend the life of that system and it's going to ensure that that sprinkler system has less corrosion related issues moving forward. So at this point in time, if anybody has any questions, um, let us know. All right, thanks, All right, thanks Jake. Jake. Um, we are we are well past our 50 minutes or an hour. Um, always give them more than they came for. That's our motto here at Reliable. We understand if you've had to leave or um, or if you have to leave now, we appreciate your coming by. Uh, we are going to stay live here for just a few minutes and answer some questions that have come in. Um, so let's uh, jump right on one here. Um, Jake, I'm going to make this one for you. Um, we're familiar with utilizing nitrogen on dry and pre-action. We have a project with known MIC and would like to utilize the nitrogen on the wet system. System is somewhat large, several stories, multiple sprinkler control assemblies. Is there anything special to consider when using nitrogen on such a large wet system? Um, yeah, so on that, for, to that question, we'd have to look at the size of it, um, the feasibility, of, you know, how much nitrogen you're looking at and what level of protection. So from there, I would say we probably need to get some more details and ensure that MIC is your only problem that's going on inside there. Make sure that it's not electrochemical corrosion or some other um, setup that's going on and make sure that it's really going to take care of the issues that you're having. Um, so from there, I would say maybe some additional investigation needs to be done to make sure that you know utilizing nitrogen on a wet system is going to take care of your 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 problem. Yeah, and I I think I would also add there the other thing that um, that needs to be kept in mind is that anytime that water's drained out, you now have to retreat it as it goes back in. So uh, unlike the uh, the dry system, uh, the pre-action where you can simply turn the the uh, compressor on or the nitrogen generator and walk away, uh, there's going to be some additional uh, work involved with uh, with drain downs and refills. So depending on how often that happens within that building. Uh, might be just another thing uh, to consider. Uh, second question, Jake, I'm going to run this one past you as well. Can the N2 blast be retrofitted to existing pre-action assemblies? From I would just say from our standpoint, mechanically, not a problem. Uh, from the benefits and advantages standpoint, we'll let Jake touch on that. Yeah, they can absolutely be um, added to a retrofitted system. Um, really need to look at you know the age of the system, the, the leak rate of the system, make sure it's falling within NFPA 25 guidelines to make sure that the nitrogen generator can handle it. Um, our, our equipment is sized to handle 25 leak rates, but you know every now and then you hear about these ones that have a much larger leak rate than that. We want to make sure that the system is sized appropriately so that you're still staying in that you know suggested runtime and you're not overworking the equipment. Um, sometimes it is viable to upsize the nitrogen to make sure it can work, but you can absolutely add it to an existing facility. Now, keep in mind, um, we haven't figured out how to make them regrow pipe yet. So when we do that, we'll be in a when it'll be in a new portion of the business. But um, if you have systems that are existing that have been experiencing pinhole leaks, you may still have some additional pinhole leaks that pop up down the road because the pipe was so far gone that the nitrogen is not going to help it. But what it's going to do is help slow down what's taking place inside there. So some additional steps that may need to be taken, but absolutely can be added to an existing pre-action system. OK, and then uh, two questions related. Um, the specifications often call for all the equipment to be installed in the riser room. Um, do the auto purges and um, uh, things like that work when they're that close to the riser? Um, can the purge valve uh, be installed right on the riser? Yeah, the, the purge valve can be installed on the riser. Um, with that, though, you're injecting nitrogen right next to the purge valve. So in some in some situation like that, I understand the data centers a lot of times it's very difficult to get out into the facility um, to, to put the purge valves. You can put them in there. I would recommend something as simple as a sample port on each system to ensure that you have the ability to go out there and verify yourself that you're getting purity throughout the whole sprinkler system and not just at the riser. Great. OK, so a couple questions from uh, for the reliable side. Um, 
The question is, do pre-action systems require the FDT calculations, the fluid uh, delivery time calculation? Uh, the answer to that is no, it's not a requirement. Uh, could there be some potential advantages? Yes. Um, you know, we did dry systems for many, many, many years, and we continue to do a lot of dry systems without using the program uh, and, and to some some levels of success and some levels of failure. So uh, in that with that regard, it's uh, no different than how you've always done things. And uh, uh, so the answer to the question, is it a requirement? The answer is no. Um, the second question that came in concerned the RCDS, the release circuit disable switch. Um, the question said, uh, I don't think we are allowed to have any ways to disable the uh, sprinkler system. Is this approved by the AHJ? Um, so that's kind of a two part answer. Um, what you may be referring to is the upcoming requirement that the solenoid be monitored for the removal of the coil. It was very common uh, with these systems when doing testing to prevent accidentally releasing the solenoid to simply remove the coil and let it dangle on the wires. Uh, and then you can check the magnetism of the coil uh, to see if it will or will not have released the system. The problem with removing the coil is it's not monitored. There's no signal that the coil's been removed or, or left removed. So an upcoming requirement will be that those solenoids uh, are monitored for the coil being removed from the system. As far as the RCDS switch goes itself, that's a little different animal. It's a mechanical device, a key switch that disables the connection to the solenoid, but at the same time, remember what it does, it puts the release panel into a supervisory condition such that it can't be left that way uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and I would give credit to uh, part of this uh, answer to, to um, technical service manager Brandon Telford. Uh, in 2010, uh, a requirement was added in 72 to have a device such as an RCDS on the system. So you may be in a little bit of uh, murky water with requirements with your AHJ uh, locally and the NFPA 72 requirements, but uh, that's one of the reasons that that RCDS switch is now standard equipment on the prepacks uh, is to comply with that NFPA 72 requirement. Uh, let's just check one last time. Uh, I wanted to see if there's any other questions. There are not. So Jake uh, from South Tech, thank you very much. Appreciate it, buddy, as always. And uh, for the rest of the crew, be safe out there and we will see you same time, same place in two weeks here at the Reliable Training Center. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Jake. Thank you.